Hello, in this video we'll learn how to approach the early stages of developing your game from an early prototype. Starting with this tic-tac-toe prototype, which shows how to drag a game piece onto the game board. We'll discover some of the domain objects in this game and review some of their implementations in GDScript. This is the starting point of a series of lessons taking you from the prototype reviewed here through multiple lessons, adding features to the point where you have a fully developed game at the end of the series. When you have a new game idea, you often want to jump straight into the editor and bring it to life. That's a natural tendency, and sometimes it's appropriate. If, for instance, you want to just see if you can get the right particle effect for something you've thought up. For overall game design, though, it can be beneficial to step back and design outside of the editor in a low-friction medium such as pencil and paper or the digital equivalent. Even though you've started with a known game, tic-tac-toe, it's often beneficial to take some time to detail the entities that make up the game and the mechanics of the game prior to starting to implement the prototype. The time spent planning here will save you a great deal of time when you implement that prototype. This planning allows you to quickly process and iterate on ideas. From this time, you'll identify the core components of your game and how they relate. These are literally the primary nouns that make up your game. In software development, these nouns are often referred to as domain objects. Having these domain objects noted gives you the framing to start the development of your game in an organized fashion. So don't worry that my handwriting is illegible to others in these examples. We'll cover all the details as needed in the lessons. In this initial planning, it was determined that the primary domain objects for this tic-tac-toe game included the game world is represented by what we will call tabletop, the tabletop contains a game board composed of game tiles. The player will drag and drop game pieces, X's and O's, onto the game board tiles. In this prototype, each of these domain objects is implemented in GDScript and arranged thusly in the Godot project. There are no hard and fast rules here. You can organize the files in the way that makes sense to you. This is just what I've come up with. The identification of and the relations between the domain objects is what's important at this stage. Now let's dig into the implementation of the prototype. The game pieces are the only elements in motion in this game. They have three primary actions applied to them, said in another way they have three distinct states. The game piece is picked up, the game piece is dragging, and the game piece is dropped. The prototype as it stands now has no real game loop or really game play, but that's okay, the prototype's sole purpose was proving out the drag and drop mechanic. If you run the game, you can see the primary actions of the game piece underway. You can see the signals firing, specifying key state changes in this, in this game world. So let's dig into how drag and drop happens here, just as an overview. So we have the game piece, which is in, happens to be an area 2D, has its collision shape. Being That being the case, it has a collision object in area 2D has, and there's its built-in input event. So anytime input happens, like a mouse click over the collision object, we get this signal gets fired. So we are listening to that signal in this this function in the game piece class. You can see that here. It's essentially it's saying if this shorthand of just saying click is because we have an input map and we defined the left mouse button and gave it the name click. So that gives us that ability to do that shortcut. Uh, syntax. And so if click happened over this game piece, we set dragging equal to two, and that's a local property here, boolean. That essentially is detecting that the player has clicked the mouse over this game piece. Once dragging is true in the process function, which happens again on every frame, we just simply ensure that the position of the game piece remains locked essentially to the position of the mouse. That button is held down and we move uh, the pointer around. We get that expected behavior of drag and drop that the game piece is going to follow the mouse. So in the same input events we're looking, if we see an input event for the left mouse button to be released, then we set dragging equal to false. And the immediate action Result of that is that in process, we'll no longer attach the game piece to the mouse position. So wherever that left mouse button was released, that game piece will remain. And again, that's you know the expected behavior for, for drag and drop. In addition to that, we emit this signal here, game piece dropped. And that's gonna set off a little chain of events. If we were over a tile, it's gonna get the game piece attached to the tile that it was over. So let's look at that a little bit where that's um, mapped. Okay, so now let's see what the result of emitting this game piece drop signal is. I'll let you know that this signal is listened to by the game board, but that attachment is done in tabletop. Tabletop's kind of the, 
the game controller or the worldview of this uh, tic-tac-toe game. It creates the board and it spawns the game pieces, the X's and O's. When it does spawn a game piece, it makes that connection for us. So this game piece drops signal, the one we just emitted. We make that connection to the game piece and we connect it to the game board on game piece dropped is what's going to get called on game board, the function there. So that's where that connection happens. So we know now that when this gets emitted, the game board is going to happen upon that signal. So it's listening for that signal. So if we go over to the game board, here we can see that the game board is built up again of tiles. There's nine of those. And each tile utilizes the built-ins for area entered and area exited. Exited, sorry, because uh, game tile is area 2D has these built-in signals. And so in game board, which does spawn the tiles for itself, it makes that connection to the game board. You know, a collision object has entered or exited one of its tiles. And those two call these methods here. And those are setting a property telling which tile that the game piece is hovering over. And the collision objects arranged in such a way that a game piece can only be uh, signaled to be over one game tile at a time. So with this setup, we have a game board of tiles. And that game board knows if a game piece is over one of those tiles. And again, it can be only over one tile at a time. And of course, we can have the game piece not over any tiles. It's, you know, it's being dragged, but it's not over the board yet. That's tracked with this property here. And that allows us to write this method down here, which again was the original listener to the signal from game piece being dropped. It emitted this signal here. Now this kind of just kind of reads semantically. So it's saying if game piece is over a tile and that tile is not already holding a piece, then we will call the attach piece on that tile. This property that was tracking, you know, which tile the game piece was over, we'll set that to null. We'll emit this final signal, player placed game piece on board, because again, the, the state of the board is going to change. We'll see that here in this method on tile, the attach piece. So let's dig into that. So if we head over to game tile, this class here, we can see that attach piece function. It takes in as parameter of the game piece, and really all this does, nothing too special. It essentially takes the sprite texture from the game piece. Again, that's that X or O. Paints it onto the, the game piece, um, has a sprite. So it takes on the, the image of that X or O, and then it just Q freeze the game piece. So that's really all that happens here. It sets some state so that this tile knows that it holds an X or an O. So back to game board. Again, we just looked at this function here on the, the game tile attach piece. Change that essentially state of the game tile, which has the effect of changing the state of the game board. So leading up to this point, we've grabbed a game piece. We've dropped it on the board. The board changed its state by, say, if it was an X, that tile now holds the image of an X. After that, we emit this signal here, player placed game piece on board. It's a little long, but it's it's specific. And that's listened to in the tabletop. That signal here, we can see it in the, the ready function of tabletop. It gets connected to itself. So this on player placed game piece on board. We can see that here. And really all that does is sort of finish the, the pseudo game loop that we have in place here. It's just spawning a new game piece in creating the loop again. So if we dropped an X, then it recreates another X game piece in the, the holder. That's it for the loop of drag and drop and then changing, you know, that drop changing the state of the game. Okay, now that we've looked at the code, let's review the gameplay once more. We can look at the output as we're interacting with the game. That mouse click has been detected in the game piece code, we can see. So now the game piece is attached to the mouse. And if we hover over a tile, we see that uh, area entered and exited being executed. And if we drop a piece, we can see that the release has been detected for the mouse. The game board um, code has detected that signal of game piece dropped. It took those actions to attach the game piece to the tile. 
And then we can see finally the tabletop received that final signal on player placed game piece on board. And that triggered it to spawn new X game piece. And this last signal of um, an area exited is just a side effect of Q freeing that game piece. That triggers a, an area exited signal for the game tile it was on. Okay, so that's it for this video. We covered a bit of code. Uh, went through it a little quickly, but don't worry, we'll cover all this code much more again. Um, we'll actually be refactoring some of it to make it better as we add new features. So as the series goes on, uh, we'll get much more familiar with that. So no worries there. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss future content. The next episode of this series will be out in one week. And remember, all this code will be in GitHub. There'll be a link in the description below so you can follow up further if you miss something in the video. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.